Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the U European Associative Algebra Seminar. It's a pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, Professor Chaba Schneider from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. The title of his talk is Computing Invariance of Algebras. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salvatore. And thank you for all for coming. Um, so can you you can hear me, I suppose. So nobody's complaining. And yes, uh, we can, can see correct. And you can see my slides, right? And so I'm gonna give you some um recent examples that we computed for invariance of the algebra. So I would like to apologize that this work is still in progress. It's very much in progress, and the results are not very conclusive. And this is a fairly new field for me. Uh, so uh, it's uh, I'm not really an expert in this area, but maybe I can tell you some interesting things that I learned. Maybe you find them interesting too. And if you already know these things, then I apologize. But hopefully, I will be able to tell something new to every one of you. And so uh, let me just uh, introduce some notation. So I'm going to work with finite dimensional Lie algebras, which I'm going to call G. And uh, Lie algebras are going to be given with a basis. So the basis I'm going to denote by x1 to xn, except for certain Lie algebras, I'm going to change the notation. So I'm assuming that the Lie algebras are defined over a field of characteristic 0. I don't need to assume that the field is, is algebraically closed. And uh, we can define or we denote by this f uh, boldface x. So this f boldface x. So it's the polynomial algebra in the variables x1 up to xn. And uh, f boldface x in round brackets is the field of rational functions in the same variables. And so we treat these things, or I usually treat these things as, as symbolic objects like polynomials and, and rational expressions, rational functions. But sometimes uh, I will also treat these things as, as actual functions from f to the n to f, or in the case of rational functions from some subset of f to the n uh, to x. So the subset is chosen so that the denominator shouldn't be zero. So we don't have to divide by zero. And, uh, and so the algebra, the Lie algebra, acts on uh, this vector space generated by these uh, basis elements, of course. So this is the adjoint action. So I, I didn't write it here. This is the adjoint. This is the adjoint action. And this action can be extended to polynomials and rational functions using the Leibniz rule. And uh, so we can define the invariant. Uh, invariance in these polynomial algebras and rational function field. Uh, and, and we denote them by fx uh, to the g. So it's a standard notation for invariance. And these are going to be the polynomials in fx, fx uh, such that the image of this polynomial is zero for each x uh, in the Lie algebra g. And we denote uh, by fx to the g. Uh, with round brackets, this is the set of rational functions in fx, uh, similarly defined such that the image of uh, f under this element is equal to zero. And uh, so this, uh, I will denote, or this is one notation I'm going to use. So this xf denotes the image of uh, the polynomial or rational function f under the element of the Lie algebra. Right, so, so these are commutative algebras. The first one is a commutative F algebra. And the second one uh, is actually a, a, a field. And, 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 and so what we want is what we want to compute uh, these uh, 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 algebras in the sense that we would like to determine generators for these invariant, uh, uh, for the invariant algebra and uh, of the field of uh, invariant rational functions. And, um, and this is a well-studied problem. So it has lots of uh, applications 
it 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 has its its uh, own applications of course in algebra it's very important in representation theory and it has lots of applications in theoretical physics so in fact uh, a lot of things uh, that I know about this subject I learned from papers uh, which were published in, in theoretical physics journals. And so my personal interest in this problem uh, arose from uh, trying to compute things in universal enveloping algebras. Uh, so, so UG is the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra. And, and it's well known that we have this symmetrization map from uh, the polynomial algebra on uh, uh, the uh, indeterminates x1 up to xn to the universal enveloping algebra of G. And this uh, map, the symmetrization map is defined uh, this way. So for a, a monomial xi1 uh, up to xik, uh, uh, its image is going to be this linear combination of these uh, 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 of, of this monomial in the universe and enveloping algebra. Uh, uh, so the coefficient is one over k factorial. So this uh, for, for this it is actually required, but so this works over field of characteristic zero. And we take uh, such linear combination for every permutation of the symmetric group on k points. So k is the length of this monomial. And so and so this, this map is, is well known that this is actually a G module isomorphism. Uh, from f uh, x to u g, and of course, as a g module isomorphism, it's going to induce uh, uh, isomorphism between the annihilator of the Lie algebra g in f x and the annihilator of the Lie algebra g in the universal enveloping algebra, and the annihilator of the Lie algebra g in the universal enveloping algebra is actually uh, the center of the universal enveloping algebra. So we get a bijection, a linear bijection uh, from f x uh, uh, to the g. So, so we get a linear bijection from the algebra of polynomial uh, invariants to the center of the universal enveloping algebra. And and in fact, so this is a linear bijection between these two commutative algebras, but this is usually not a not, not a commutative algebra isomorphism. So if G is nilpotent, it's actually a commutative algebra isomorphism. But it turns out in general that if the field has characteristic zero, and I believe it has to be also algebraically closed, then uh, the algebra of invariance is actually isomorphic to the center of the universal enveloping algebra as commutative algebra. So this is known as the Duflo isomorphism. So I think it appeared in a paper by Duflo in 77, but it also was studied by, by Dixmier. Uh, Konsevich gave a new proof in 2003 using deformation theory. No, but this is actually quite uh, quite deep. So for, for a general Lie algebra, computing this isomorphism between the invariant algebra of invariance and the center of the universal enveloping algebra is, is really uh, non-trivial. So but my, my uh, personal interest in this problem was trying to compute the center of the universal enveloping algebra. And... Um, um, and um, but but I I cannot do it yet. So I'm, I'm I can I can compute uh, the invariant algebras in some cases. Right. So to to remind you the adjoint action of the Lie algebra on uh, the field of rational functions. So here uh, I'm using the notation uh, as I introduced before. So G is a Lie algebra generated by x one to x n. So these are the basis elements. So this is generated over the field F uh, by these elements. And if we uh, choose any element in the Lie algebra, little x in G, then uh, for F uh, rational function, so we can actually calculate uh, its image under F using the partial derivatives of, uh, the, of the uh, function F or the, the rational function, rational expression F. So it works like this. So, so its action can be calculated by taking this linear combination of the partial derivatives where the coefficients are actually functions of, uh, so first degree functions in the variables. 
of uh, uh, in, in, in the basis of the Lie algebra. So this x comma x1, this is actually the Lie bracket. So this is the product in the Lie algebra. So I get a linear combination of the basis elements and I multiply this linear combination with the first partial derivative of x. And I do this for every basis element and, and, and calculate this, this sum. So it's written more compactly uh, this way. So finding uh, the rational functions uh, that I that are annihilated by a Lie algebra element is actually equivalent to solving this partial differential equation xf. So sometimes I'm going to denote the same thing by dxf. So d sort of uh, uh, indicating that is a derivation of the the field of rational functions and 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 is the, the derivation or differential operator that, that corresponds to the element x. And it's defined as this linear combination of the partial derivatives. So I, I we need to find uh, we need to find the, the rational functions which vanish under this this uh, differential uh, operator. So let me give you an example of how this works. Um, the first example is actually very simple, but it can kind of uh, illustrates what might be going on and what uh, we can do in this case. So consider the two-dimensional Lie algebra xy is generated by xy and the only uh, uh, non-trivial product is uh, between x and y and we set it to be equal to x. So this is a, a two-dimensional uh, Lie algebra. It's a solvable Lie algebra, but not near potent. And if we want to, uh, 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 want to find it's uh, uh, invariance, uh, uh, I, I should have written f x y instead of x uh, uh, bold face f, bold, bold face x here, because the, the basis is not x1, x2, the basis is x and y. So to, to, to find uh, its invariance in the rational functions, so we have to find uh, invariance uh, under the element x and we have to find invariance under the element y and so we have to solve two partial differential equations so the first is is uh, first equation that corresponds to uh, the uh, element x so this is going to be uh, uh, i mean we would have to take this sum over the basis elements and take uh, x comma xi and the partial derivative by xi, but here x comma x is obviously zero, so x comma y is going to be x, and so we have the first equation is uh, x times the partial derivative of x by y, and this has to be zero, and the second equation similarly. So we have uh, y comma x, so y comma x is minus x, and so the partial derivative by the minus x times the partial derivative of the function by x, this has to be zero. And of course, one can immediately see that uh, since uh, so we, we are working in a field, so things are invertible. So even if we are uh, working in the uh, uh, algebra of polynomial functions, there is a domain. So such a uh, equation said this, this expression is equal to zero. I mean, this is equivalent to saying that the partial derivative of x by x by y is equal to zero. So, so this, this partial derivative has to be equal to zero. And similarly, the second equation of, uh, gives the, the partial derivative of f, f by the partial derivative of x, this has to be equal to zero. So the first equation kind of says that f has to be constant uh, in the variable of y, uh, and the second equation says that f has to be constant in the variable x. And so we have uh, that f has to be constant function. So uh, here, uh, the field of, of, of rational invariance is going to be uh, just the, the field of constant functions. So we get that the field of rational invariance is equal to f, right? And so this system can be written also in a matrix form uh, using uh, 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 this uh, decomposition. So notice that that this, this system can be uh, written uh, so if we if we work out uh, the meaning of this matrix multiplication, so here the first row times this vector, this column vector corresponds to exactly the first equation. 
and the second row times this column vector corresponds to exactly corresponds exactly to the second equation so writing the system in this matrix form is possible so what we get is that uh, uh, the system is equivalent to uh, this uh, matrix equation mg times the gradient of the function f so the gradient is just the column vector consisting of uh, the partial derivatives so, so mg times the gradient of f has to be 0, 0. So it has to be uh, in both coordinates has to be equal to 0. And notice that this mg, uh, so this matrix that I denote by mg, so this is nothing but the multiplication table for the Lie algebra x. So here the first row represents uh, products with respect to the first basis elements, which is x. So x times x is equal to zero, x times y is equal to x. Then the second row represents the product with respect to the second uh, basis element, which is y. So, so y times x is minus x, and, and y times y is equal to zero. So, so mg denotes the multiplication table of, uh, of g. Right? Um, so, so this is this example. So this is, of course, very simple. And so one more uh, observation still about this example, even though it's a very simple thing. So, uh, uh, so uh, here we can consider this matrix. So the multiplication table, uh, which uh, I denoted by MG. So it's a two by two matrix in this case. So we can consider this matrix uh, with entries in a field, uh, namely uh, in the field of uh, F, X, Y. So I should have written F, x comma y because uh, these are the variables the basis elements of the Lie algebra right so so the so the matrix entries can be viewed as uh, as, as as elements in the field of rational functions in the uh, basis elements of the Lie algebra and 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 of course uh, if we have a matrix over a field, we can do our usual matrix operations to MG. So we can do this sort of row uh, operations and 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 we can bring uh, this matrix into uh, uh, echelon form, standard row echelon form. And if we if we do this, so the, the, the matrix is going to be equivalent, of course, to the identity matrix because this matrix is invertible. So it's it's determinant is is x squared. So its matrix is invertible, so its uh, its uh, 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 echelon form is actually the identity matrix, and 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 so I can change in my uh, matrix equation. I can change uh, the matrix with anything which is uh, row equivalent uh, to the original matrix, and I can get I can immediately get this simple uh, simpler uh, system of equations. So the first row means that the, the derivative, the partial derivative of f by x is equal to zero. And the second row just says that the partial derivative of f by y is equal to zero. So I can do this sort of multiplication, uh, do this simplification. And I get, again, that the uh, uh, field of, uh, of invariance is going to be just equal to f. So this is um, a simple example just to uh, warm up. So let's consider a more complicated example, uh, which is uh, the example of standard filiform Lie algebras. So the standard filiform Lie algebras are sometimes uh, called Lie algebra of maximal class. So this is denoted, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to denote it simply again by G. So I will write the, the basis elements of this Lie algebra this way that that I will uh, denote the first basis element by x, and then uh, uh, the other basis elements from uh, by y0 up to yn. And uh, the multiplication uh, rule between these basis elements is just this, that x times uh, yi is equal to yi minus one. So x times y0 is equal to zero. Okay, so I will get that the center of this Lie algebra is, is one dimensional, is generated by y0. And uh, this is a Neopotent Lie algebra of dimension uh, n plus two, and it has Neopotency class n plus one. And its invariant algebra is extremely interesting because it's related to uh, lots of invariant algebras in classical invariant theory. So the invariant 
and algebra of this uh, uh, Lie algebra is related to the uh, uh, algebra of covariance of uh, for the binary uh, uh, form of degree n, and 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 this has been studied uh, since uh, the nineteenth century, and. And, and, and so this is, uh, e even though the algebra is relatively simple, uh, the invariants are actually quite complicated, especially the polynomial invariants. And so there is this theorem that um, I'm gonna state. So this theorem is um, this kind of folklore. So it appears in, uh, various bits appear in, in works of Dismier, Ohm's, Bedrock Tube, and by uh, other peoples with, some things kept being discovered. I also rediscovered some bits of this theorem myself. Uh, but it, what, what happens is, so the description of the invariance. So considering a rational invariance, I'm going to denote rational invariance this way. So f x comma uh, bold face y. So bold face y is going to denote these variables. Uh, come. Do this. Uh, so this is y. So I'm gonna just denote, uh, just uh, uh, contract uh, the variables y zero up to y n as both face y, and and so the rational invariant, the, the all the field of rational invariants is uh, sorry I made a mistake. So this is a field extension. So the field of rational invariants is a field extension of the underlying field F by n plus one. No, sorry, by n algebraically independent uh, elements, uh, which uh, the first one is being y0. So notice that y0 lies actually in the center of the algebra. So it's obviously going to be a polynomial invariant and a rational invariant. So y0 is kind of z1, so it's the first uh, of the generators. And there are n generators. So it's going to be a purely transcendental extension of the underlying field of transcendence degree n, uh, the, the, the question of rational or question of polynomial invariance is much more complicated. So I'm going to give you a table which summarizes uh, the number of generators for these polynomial invariants. Uh, but what can be said about polynomial invariants that they are uh, they 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 lie in the uh, algebra. Uh, generated by uh, y0 and these field generators and uh, generated also by the inverse of uh, y0. So it's kind of, it lies, so the, 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 the algebra of polynomial invariants uh, is going to be contained in the algebra, in the localization of the algebra generated by the, the, the generators of the field. Uh, uh, and this localization is taken by y0. So it's an interesting thing. And it's also true that uh, in, in this case, and it's also tr it's true for Newpotent Lie algebras in general, uh, that uh, the, the, the field of uh, rational invariance is going to be the fraction, equal to the fraction field of polynomial invariance. And so the dimension of uh, the algebra of uh, uh, polynomial invariance, and then here I mean the crude dimension, so the crude, crude dimension is going to be the same as the transcendence uh, degree of the, of the uh, uh, field of rational invariance. So the crude dimension is also going to be equal to n. So this is known, and it's, it can be found in, in the literature. And about computing generators for uh, the uh, algebra of polynomial invariants, as I said, it's going to be, it's rather messy. So people worked on it. And here's a, a, a small table of how many generators uh, the algebra of polynomial invariants uh, have. So if n is equal to one, so in this case, the, the Lie algebra uh, is actually just the Heisenberg Lie algebra. And uh, it's known, so it's known that uh, in case of the Heisenberg Lie algebra, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the algebra of polynomial invariants uh, is going to be just generated by the center. So it has one generator. 
So if n is equal to two, we get an algebra of dimension four. So uh, the uh, algebra of ration, or algebra of polynomial invariance, we have two generators. So if the algebra has uh, dimension five, we get five, we get four generators, and then we get five generators, and, and then uh, explosion happens. So if the algebra has dimension seven, which corresponds to the case when n is equal to five, uh, the algebra of polynomial invariance is going to have 23 generators. Uh, uh, in the next case, we are having 26 generators, and then 147 generators, and we have 69 generators for n is equal to 8. And I think it, uh, uh, this is known up to, up to n is equal to 8. I think n is equal to 9. I'm not sure if... Uh, it can be found. Somebody actually computed it. And and, and this, uh, as I said, this is related to problems in classical invariant theory. So it was already studied by people like Gordon, other people in 19th century also worked on this problem. So I think Shioda determined uh, the case uh, uh, n is equal to 8. Uh, Kearney determined the case n is equal to 7. The case is up to n is equal to 6, were determined by uh, Gordon himself. And there are other people, Bed Bratuk, for example, computed generators and gave uh, compact forms, more compact forms for these generators uh, in these cases when the number of generators is large. So, so, so this is the sort of general picture about uh, standard filiform Lie algebra. So let me show you one computation that we can do uh, using computer explicitly. And, and so let's consider the case when n is equal to three. So I'm considering standard filiform Lie algebras, but for the sake of considering a, a relatively simple example, let's suppose that n is equal to three, and then my Lie algebra looks like this. So it's five-dimensional. So the generators are x, uh, y, zero up to y three, and the multiplication rule is is just this. And the multiplication table of this algebra, so it looks like this. So it's a five by five matrix with entries uh, being linear combinations of the basis elements and is a fairly simple matrix. And so we can calculate its uh, echelon form. And so calculating the echelon form, we can sort of uh, reduce this column, but there's nothing much more we can do. So we could of course reduce the leading entry in the first row, but it wouldn't give actually any difference. So, so this means that that uh, so if we want to want to calculate uh, rational or polynomial invariance, we have to solve these uh, equations. So the first equation, of course, we'll just say so the first equation, which corresponds to the second row actually. So the second row of this matrix, the first equation says that the partial derivative of f by x is equal to zero, and so uh, uh, we just have that f is constant. Uh, in x, in the variable x. So it, we can kind of eliminate, if we see such an equation, we can kind of eliminate the variable x from consideration. But the second equation uh, cannot really be simplified more. So the second equation is that this, this, this linear or combination of uh, partial derivatives, so y0 times the uh, partial derivative of f by y1, uh, plus y1 times the partial derivative by y2, plus uh, y2 times the partial derivative by y3. So this is actually equal to zero. Um, and so, and so what, what can we do? So we, we obtained from the previous slide that uh, the algebra of uh, invariant rational functions of uh, this Lie algebra is equal to the set of rational solutions uh, uh, of this partial differential equation. So considering only the variables y. So, so by the first equation, we kind of uh, eliminated the variable x and we only consider uh, 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 functions in the variable y, but still we have this partial differential equation that uh, uh, the, 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 the functions have to satisfy. And so to solve this, this, uh, 
this equation, uh, I, uh, as I said, a lot of uh, my knowledge comes from comes from papers in, in physics literature, and so this is why I, this is why I saw uh, this method of characteristics. So apparently, this is a fairly standard method for solving uh, partial differential equations. But uh, we can kind of translate this method into this algebraic language, and and we can obtain some some interesting insight. And uh, so it's not uh, what I, I'm I'm not the one who invented it, of course. I mean, this is as I said, this is a standard method for solving uh, partial differential equations. And I saw this method so written down in uh, in uh, some uh, papers published in theoretical physics journal. And I was interested in whether we can, we can apply this method in our, in our uh, uh, algebraic uh, context. So notice that the, the partial differential equation can be written in this form. So uh, I have uh, here a linear combination of the partial derivatives of uh, the function f, and the coefficients are all functions in, in y. So in, in this case, the coefficients are actually quite simple. So this is uh, actually the coefficient a, a1, a1, and this is the coefficient a2. So this is here the coefficient a3, and the coefficient a0 is equal to zero because the partial derivative of f by y0 doesn't occur in this equation, right? And, and the, the, the method of characteristics uh, is based on, so I'm, I'm gonna simplify things. I'm gonna give you like a brief summary of how this method can be used to solve this particular equation. So it's a general method, but again, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm far from, from being an expert in this field. And I myself learned this uh, quite recently. So uh, the, the idea is that we are looking for these uh, so-called characteristic curves uh, such that uh, a solution of this partial differential equation would be constant uh, if we restrict this solution to one of these curves. So, so formally, uh, we... We, we say that a curve, so a, a curve in this case would be like a function of t, which has uh, n plus one variables. So we have n plus one dimensional real algebra in this case, so the, so the uh, or the n, n plus one by dimensional uh, space in this case, so n plus one variables, so the number of uh, variables y is n plus one. So uh, a characteristic curve would be a function in t, uh, uh, such that the, the components, it has n plus one components, and each component is uh, some sort of uh, a rational algebraic function in the variable t. And so what we want from this characteristic curve is that uh, the derivative of the ith component should be equal to uh, the substitution of this curve into the coefficient ai. So this ai is still the coefficient of uh, the uh, uh, ith uh, partial derivative. So ai is a function of y, so it has n plus one components, so we can substitute these n plus one components of the curve into the function ai. So what we get here, so this is a function from f to f. And so we, what we want is that uh, the partial derivative of this uh, ith uh, component but not sorry, not partial, it's the actual derivative of the ith component should be equal to uh, the function uh, ai restricted uh, to this uh, curve. So, so why does it help? Because if f is a solution of uh, this equation, uh, of the original equation, so here is my equation in its general, more general form. So if f is a solution of this equation, uh, then if we restrict f uh, to this curve, meaning we substitute uh, the components of the curve into the n plus one coordinates of f, and we calculate derivative by t, then uh, using the multi-variable uh, chain rule, what we get is that it's gonna be a linear combination uh, with uh, uh, sort of the coefficient being ai 
uh, restricts it to this curve times the ith partial derivative of f also restricted to this curve. And this is going to be zero but because f is the solution of such, an, uh, uh, f is the solution of the equation. So, so, so what we have is that if we restrict f to this curve, then the derivative is going to be zero, which is saying that, that, that the function f has to be constant uh, along uh, a, a characteristic curve. So if we can find enough characteristic curves, uh, then we can solve the partial differential equation because uh, we can uh, sort of uh, define a, um, we can define a uh, initial condition. And uh, uh, so hopefully we find these characteristic curves and sort of we want to define the function at a certain point, we find a characteristic curve which is goes through this point and we sort of follow this curve at, until it reaches uh, some domain uh, uh, where the initial condition is defined. So, and then we can do this algebraically. So let me show you in our case, so how we can solve, uh, how, we, how we can find these characteristic curves for this particular case. So remember that we want the, the CI prime. So I'm gonna write prime instead of uh, D over DT for the, for the, for the uh, derivative. So the CI prime should be equal to uh, AI uh, substituted C0 up to CN, right? And so in our case, so in our case, our, our equation looks like this. So, so A0 in particular is equal to zero. So that means that, that, that the first equation that we get for C0 is that C0 prime uh, should be equal to uh, C1 up to Z, Cn substituted into the zero function. So C0 prime should be equal to zero. So it means that C0 prime should be just a constant function. So I'm going to denote it by U0. So C0 prime, uh, so I, I, I get, it can be any constant function, of course. So U0 is an element of the field. And then remembering that C1 was equal to Y0. Uh, so that means that C1, uh, sorry, A1 was uh, Y0. So the, the second equation says that, that C1 uh, prime uh, should be equal to uh, uh, the C, uh, the AI uh, restricted to the curve C0 up to Cn. So A1 is Y0. And so this means that uh, C1 prime should be equal to C0 of T, right? But we already determined C0 of T, and this was a constant, so it says that C1 T should be equal to uh, this constant U0 T plus U1. So U1 is another uh, element of the field, right? So it's another constant. And so similarly, what we get is that C2 prime of T should be equal to C1 of T. And uh, remembering that C1 of, uh, uh, remembering here, so we get this because A1 is equal to uh, Y, A, A2, sorry, this is A2. So the function A2 is equal to Y1. So this is how we get the C1 of T. So we get that, uh, that, that C2 prime should be equal to the derivative of C2 should be equal to the previous function. So C2, of t should be equal to the integral of the previous function, which is one half of uh, the u0 t squared plus u1 t plus u2. And um, uh, so we get similarly that uh, the last curve, so C3, has to be also a polynomial uh, a curve, a curve defined by a polynomial. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, that uh, uh, form. So what we get is that we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can choose uh, these constants u1, u0, u1, u2, and u3 uh, arbitrarily. And for every choice of these constants in f to the four, which we will denote by uh, this bold face u, for for every choice of this constant. But we get a, we get a, a characteristic curve, 
uh, which I'm going to denote by C u of t with, with these uh, uh, coordinates. So, and, and I can choose these constants freely. So I get kind of like a, a family of characteristic curves, uh, which is uh, 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 parameterized by elements of F to the four. And uh, so, so what can we what can we do with this? Uh, so suppose that so we need usually what when we work with uh, differential equations or partial differential equations we need some sort of initial condition, and so this is the case here also. And so the the, the initial condition is going to be a function, a rational function f zero which is going to be defined uh, over some sort of domain, uh, which is gonna be denoted, which we are going to denote by gamma. So, so gamma is a subset of F to the four. So gamma is a subset of F to the four, and it's going to be a subset of F to the four defined by the fact uh, that the second coordinate is equal to zero. So it's kind of like a, a, a hyperplane. So the second coordinate is equal to zero. And we can define uh, this uh, uh, initial condition on this gamma. So it's going to be a rational function in only three variables because one variable is constant zero. So it's going to be a, a rational function in three variables, which we are going to denote by F zero. And F zero is arbitrary. So I can define, I can, I can pick my initial condition any way I want. And so in order to get uh, uh, the, the theorem, uh, which I'm going to state later, so I'm going to normalize these, these curves in such a way that uh, we are going to assume that our curves, uh, so this characteristic curve, is going to be parametrized in such a way that at the point t equals zero, at the point t is equal to zero, we have uh, that uh, the point, the curve, the point of this curve lies in gamma. So this is equivalent to making the second coordinate equal to zero when t is equal to zero. So that means that the u one has to be equal to zero, right? So, so this, 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 uh, uh, so this parameterization corresponds to choosing u one equal to zero, and so here our curves are going to be parameterized only by three coordinates u uh, zero, u two, u three, which are elements of f three. I'm sorry about the dog. Sorry. Um, right. And so what happens here is that with this restriction, so this parameterization, we have that for each point in F4, which uh, each point denoted by Y, uh, Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. So for each point in F4, there's gonna be a unique curve uh, such that uh, the curve at zero is going to uh, lie in gamma and uh, the curve is going to go through the point y at some point. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to interrupt. I, I will be back in a minute. Okay. No, I'm sorry, I, I'm back. And uh, so where was I? So, so with this, so with this change in the parameterization, we have that for each point in F four, is going to be a unique curve which goes through this point, and at t equals zero, the point of the curve is going to lie. On this domain that we denoted by by gamma, right? So I 
prepared a bit of picture for you. So to visualize what's going on. So here we have the coordinates y0, y1, y2, and y3. So as physicists often do, I kind of contracted two uh, coordinates y2 and y3 on the same axis. So gamma, uh, the, the domain gamma corresponds to uh, uh, the equation y1 is equal to zero. So the domain gamma is this plane. So it's really two dimensional, but you can only throw in uh, three dime. I can only do three dimensions and two dimension. So the, uh, the domain gamma corresponds to this equation y1 is equal to zero. And I have a point, I have an arbitrary point in my four, in my four, di four dimensional space. Uh, uh, which I call Y. So as I said, there's going to be a unique curve which goes through this point. And this curve is denoted by Cu of uh, T. So, so this curve is going to go through my point Y. And uh, so I am following this curve until it hits uh, my uh, initial domain gamma. And on gamma, I have uh, my initial condition defined, which is going to be f0. Uh, so I'm going to define fy uh, as f0 uh, y prime. I don't know. I mean, this, this point I'm going to denote by y prime, right? Because remember uh, that uh, the crucial property of the characteristic curve is that uh, solution of this equation is constant when we restrict it to the characteristic curve. And so, and so uh, the function f, if I want it to be a solution of this, of this differential equation, so it has to be constant along the characteristic curve. And so I, it has to be, at, at the point y, it has to be the same at, as at the point y prime, right? And so what happens is, um, right, so this is the definition This is the definition of f. And so this way I, I get a function, uh, a map psi from the field of rational functions in my three variables, uh, u0, u2, and u3, into uh, the uh, set of solutions of the partial differential equation. So this is why I denoted. So f uh, y0 up to y3 uh, uh, to the d. So this is the, the, the invariance, the, 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 the rational functions which are invariant under this uh, operator D. So this is the set of solutions of the partial differential equation. And so this psi is an isomorphism of fields. And so in particular, if we want to get generators for the, uh, the uh, field of uh, invariant functions, I have to just calculate uh, the images of the generators of the domain under this function psi. And so the images of uh, this domain psi uh, u0, psi u2, psi u3, so they are going to generate uh, the, the field of invariant functions. And it's going to be a generator. In this case, it's going to be the generator. It's going to be the generators for the field of invariant functions of the Lie algebra, of this uh, standard free form Lie algebra. And so this can be calculated. So we have an implementation of this procedure which was written in collaboration with my student, Igor Martin Silva. If somebody wants to check out, it's available in this repository on GitHub. It doesn't have a lot of functionality yet, but it can, for instance, calculate uh, these generators for, for instance, uh, standard free-form real algebras. In fact, it can calculate now the generators for any finite dimensional new potent Lie algebra. Of course, uh, we have to uh, be uh, careful. I mean, the dimension cannot be extremely huge, but in this case, this is quite an easy calculation. And, and you can see that uh, 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 we calculate uh, these generators uh, by calculating this isomorphism psi. So as I said, this psi is an isomorphism, so we calculate this isomorphism psi uh, between the, the fraction field of multivariate polynomial rings so the original domain of this psi is generated by y0, y1, y2, and the, the, the codomain is generated by uh, uh, y0, y1, y2, y3, and x. 
So these uh, correspond to the generators of the Lie algebra. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, y0 of the domain, the image is going to be y0. As we notice, this is an element of the Lie algebra which lies in the center. So obviously it's going to be a, uh, a, a polynomial invariant. Uh, so y1 is going to be uh, going to this generator. So it's a, it's a quadratic invariant. And y2 is going to be uh, is going to this uh, cubic invariant. So you can see that here we have a division by y0 division by y0 square. As you remember, I, I noticed or I, I mentioned that uh, polynomial invariants are going to be lying in the poly in the algebra generated by these uh, uh, well not exactly uh, generated by the invariants here. So here I removed this division by. Uh, uh, by the zero. So polynomial invariants are going to be lying in the localization of the algebra generated by these inv invariants. The localization is taken by y zero. But uh, calculating polynomial invariants is a bit more complicated. And in fact, so here there is going to be an extra generator for the algebra of polynomial invariants, which is uh, uh, can be written as z2 uh, square plus z3. Uh, 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 Z2Q plus Z3 squared, where Z2 is this guy, and Z3 is that guy, and this is divided by Y0 squared. So what happens is that if you calculate this thing, it's going to be uh, divisible by Y0. And um, in, in fact, it's going to be divisible by Y0 squared. So if you divide by Y0 squared, we get a polynomial uh, 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 expression. So, how much more time do I have, Salvatore? Uh, you you have uh, nine minutes. Okay, nine minutes. So let me tell you how to deal with. So in this case, this algebra was relatively simple because in the end we just had to solve one equation, and so and and so. Uh, we solved this equation. I mean, we had to solve two equations, but one equation just said that the variable x is, is, is not needed. And we, in the end, we just had to solve one equation. So what happens if you have to solve two uh, or more equations? So let me give you this example that I, I took from a book on this subject. I forgot to uh, write down. Uh, 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 the book itself, but so the example was taken uh, from this book. And, and so here we have a four dimensional Lie algebra uh, generated by E1 up to E4, and the multiplication table is that. And so here what happens is that E1 is central. So we notice that that products uh, with E1 is equal to zero. So E1 lies in the center, and so E1 is going to be a, a, a polynomial invariant of the algebra. But E2 is not central. So first, we need to find solutions of this first equation, which corresponds to derivation by E2. And so this first equation has this form. So uh, E2, comma E1, uh, uh, sorry, E2, comma E3, which is equal to E1. So this is where this E1 comes from, times uh, the third partial derivative of F plus uh, E2, comma E4, which is this guy, uh, uh, which whose uh, value is going to be E3 times the fourth partial derivative of F. And so we can use the, the method of characteristics and uh, the solutions are going to form a field, which I'm going to denote by K1. And if you follow the, this, this method, you get the generators of K1 are going to be E1, E2, and, and this uh, third guy. So it's going to be generated by three uh, uh, algebraically independent things. But now we have to uh, go on and and, and apply the operator, which corresponds to E3 multiplication by or derivation by E3. 
And so uh, this operator will have this form. So minus E1 times the second partial derivative minus E2 times the fourth partial derivative. And so you have to calculate the kernel of this operator and you sort of would have to intersect these two kernels. You would have to find the intersection of the two sets of solutions of these two partial differential equation. But what, what happens here is that this field that we obtain in the first step is going to be invariant. So it's invariant under the second operator. So it's it's easy to calculate that if you if you apply the second operator to the generators of this field, so uh, the first generator goes to zero, the second generator goes to minus uh, uh, times minus one times the first generator, and the third generator is going to be two times the product of the first two generators. So so this is not a coincidence. So this always happens in solvable Lie algebras. So, so what happens is that, so we can identify K1. So K1 is actually just a field of, of rational functions in these three variables. So we can identify K1 with the field of rational functions in the variables Z1, uh, Z1, Z2, and Z3. And so what we have is that we restrict this operator to this field and the restriction of this operator for the, uh, to this field will have this form. So it will be the, the second partial derivative multiplied by minus Z1 times the third partial derivative multiplied by Z1 times Z, Z1 times Z2. So here, the, the situation is very similar, except here we get functions of degree two instead of just linear functions. And so we can solve, again, we, we apply the, the, the method of characteristics to this uh, system or this equation, and we find that K2 is going to be uh, uh, the, the the set of functions uh, which lie in K1 and are invariant under the operator D3. And this is going to be a, a new field which is generated by two uh, algebraically independent elements. So it's going to be generated by E1 and the second element. And, and in this case, we don't have to do more. So it's going to be the invariant field of the Lie algebra G. Uh, so again, this is implemented. So, so our implementation works for, for this kind of uh, Lie algebra. So this is a solvable Lie algebra, which is not neopotent. And, and, and here we define in the first line, we define this Lie algebra in the, uh, in the I mean, I, as I said, I forgot to say, so the implementation is written in Sage. The first line we define is Lie algebra. Uh, or the first line we define the multiplication table of this Lie algebra. The second line we define the Lie algebra, and then we we, we call this function invariant field isomorphism, and it tells us that uh, uh, this isomorphism uh, goes from uh, the field of rational functions in two indeterminates y zero and y one to the field of uh, uh, rational functions determined or generated by uh, uh, E1 and uh, this second expression. And notice that the second expression is, is a scalar multiple of what we obtained uh, uh, for the generator of K2. So the field of rational functions is generated by uh, uh, these two expressions, All right? And I think, so I said, there's this theorem, which is probably well known uh, in the physics literature, probably a, a, a Occurred that in, in the case of solvable Lie algebras, if you have a basis x1 up to xn, in, in such a way that for i less than j, the product is a linear combination of things only up to i. And in a solvable Lie algebra, you can always take such a basis. Then if we define ki to be the field of rational invariance of the basis elements x1 up to xi, so this field is going to be invariant under the operator, which corresponds to the to the next basis element, so the x i plus one. And so what we can do is uh, we can we, we calculate uh, these fields uh, su successively, and we calculate uh, this operator uh, restricted to these fields, and we use the method of characteristics. And here, what happens is that you have to write. So these, these fields are going to be given by generators and you will have to write the images of these generators under this operation as uh, rational expressions or polynomial expressions of the uh, actual generators. And so for, for this, we use Grubner basis to, to solve this problem.
And so let me finish uh, with one uh, example just to show that, for instance, uh, I, I don't know how visible it is, but uh, so here we take the, the Lie algebra of uh, strictly upper triangular matrices, eight by eight strictly upper by triangular matrices. So it has uh, 28, uh, uh, there's dimension 28, so it's a larger algebra and uh, calling invariant field isomorphism. Uh, uh, returns these generators. It's, it has four, so the invariant field has four generators. So X1, it has a one dimensional center, and then uh, the other generators are going to be more complicated. So this computation takes a, a couple of seconds. Larger computations, unfortunately, you don't work at the moment because uh, the problem with the Grubner basis computation. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Shaba, for your interesting talk. Are there any questions? Um, maybe there is some comments on the chat by Yanis Siligakis. You probably already answered that during your talk. No, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking, how, how is the chat? Computer. Well, I mean, the question is whether, so based on pattern matching type of software. Yeah, I mean, we use a uh, Sage. So mm -hmm. it's all symbolic. We don't use any numerical approximation in, in our computations. So all the calculations are symbolic. So the computations are done in the system Sage and 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 and, and the, the well the, the, the methodology is what I outlined. So uh, we we kind of uh, took this method of characteristics and we we sort of make it algebra so we we, we can uh, so in these cases for solvable for new potent Lie algebra so everything is algebraic for solvable Lie algebra there are some problems so non-algebraic functions occur as solutions for the equations for characteristic curves and at the moment we don't yet have a good way of dealing with those uh, algorithmically Okay, any other questions, comments, or remarks? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, I thank you. And uh, we will resume on the next Monday at the usual time. Yeah. Bye bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you very much. Thank you for Bye, this Shabba. opportunity and thank you for listening. Thank you. If you put it on Facebook,